So, no slides, a few pages, and some demo code. And I'm going to start out with a few caveats here. So this is one of those few calls where I'm I, I'm on the call and I'm happy that I can say I am a program manager on the, the Microsoft Graph developer experience team. I am not wearing my developer hat today because as you will quickly learn, my experience in JavaScript is spectacularly thin. Um, I'm also going to say my experience and understanding of both SharePoint FX and SharePoint are also spectacularly weak. So you might ask the question, well, why on earth are you here talking to us? And it, really this, this search here in NPM is kind of the answer to that question. So the Microsoft.Graph types and the Microsoft Graph client library are two libraries that I am the, the PM for, uh, and uh, our Graph SDK team is the team that builds these libraries. Um, you'll also notice uh, some other items on here, like the uh, we updated this six months ago. Now, I'm sure you're much more familiar with the PNPJS things, which was updated 21 days ago. There's a whole lot more love in the community for uh, the PMPJS library. And yet just because of the way things happened and, and historically, we have this graph client that our Microsoft team own. And if you were on the call uh, from a few weeks ago, I talked about the work that we were looking into doing with regards to trying to develop a fluent API and auto-generated in the same way that we do for other libraries and how we were looking in to try and find a way of doing that generation so it can also work with the PNPJS. So one of the reasons that I'm here and kind of showing you the what we're doing the Microsoft Graph client is largely to learn from your community and to understand how we can improve and how we can stop duplicating effort. Because I, I hate the fact that we have a situation where we're doing the same things. It's the same as what Vesa was just talking about the Stardust and the, the, um, the Fluent thing. It makes no sense to do di two different things and then have developers have to make decisions as to which one do I, am, uh, do I have to use. So I want to get more involved in this community to understand what your needs are, to try and understand more about the problems that you're trying to solve so that we can make sure that we can learn from PMPJS and we can do things that are closer there and maybe hopefully vice versa. We can, some of the things that we build will be valuable to the, the SharePoint community also. So I mentioned these two libraries that we have and I don't have access to the chat. So if people are going to be asking questions, I'm not going to be able to see them. So feel free, anybody, to come off mic and yell at me with questions as we go along. So there's two libraries, and I'll explain the difference between the two of them. The, the Microsoft Graph Client is a JavaScript library. And I'll, as uh, Sebastian mentioned, which he hurtfully called the old library, but I understand it is has been around for a little while. This is the library that has that syntax of being able to say uh, client.api and then it has all the OData type functions. And you can install it from AP, uh, NPM. You can also install it from JS Deliver. And there's instructions here basically how you set this up and to be able to make calls. I'm going to scroll down here and hopefully somewhere down here it talks and shows you how to go and retrieve email messages and how to send email messages and that kind of thing a couple of things to point out here is we have recently introduced these things called authentication providers which are wrappers around the microsoft uh, auth library and in the demo i'll show you how that plugs into the overall uh, setup so this is kind of as i said purely javascript way of making calls to the graph and constructing URIs and being able to uh, get at the JSON response body. But really, it is just a JSON blob or a, a JavaScript object at that point. The next library is the one that we auto-generate, which is the Microsoft Graph TypeScript type. So we use the, the metadata of Microsoft Graph 
in order to generate a set of models so that if you are working in TypeScript, you get this tr strongly typed experience to be able to see what the properties are uh, on all the different uh, classes. And as Microsoft Graph grows and grows and we add more capabilities in there, this just provides that nice discovery mechanism. And this is available both on NPM and available uh, on definitely typed. And there is source code available that allows you to get the beta libraries. We're not currently publishing the beta libraries, but that's something that we need to get onto and get those published too, so that people can experiment uh, with the, uh, the beta capabilities that are available. So the demo that I'm going to show you is basically, it's a React application. And I went to the graph developer portal and I went to the getting started and I went to find the React app. And you can actually download it all as a complete app or you can just walk through it and say, create your project. And it walks you through step by step as to how to do it, how to register the, port, the app in the portal and how to get some information. And I'm, I'm just gonna show you running it here. So this is, this is how you access the graph if you're not running in SharePoint world at the moment. And it's, it's a very simplistic React tutorial and I can click here and do sign in and I'm going to foolishly go and connect to my own personal account here. And it's gonna recognize, it's gonna go off and find out who I am and it's gonna provide a couple of additional tabs. The built-in one, the, the tutorial um, shows you how to get the list of calendar events that uh, on your calendar and I went in just to prove that I could actually add a tab and I'm not completely hopeless in JavaScript. I went and read, read all of my messages in my email inbox, right? Let's just take a quick look at what that code looks like. So it, it was created from from basically just using create react app and then copying and pasting stuff in from the, the getting started. But the getting started actually does a bit of a kind of what I'm considering the, an anti-pattern with regards to how you use the graph client. What it would end up doing is every time you'd go to make a call to the graph, it would go and create a new instance of that client. So I did some refactoring on this library. And if we look at the class app and look at the constructor of it, one of the first things that you have to do if you're working with MSAL is set up a user agent application to allow you to do an implicit flow login. And we pull the app ID from the client ID, uh, from the config file, we pull the client ID from the config file and the redirect URL. And then we go and say, well, have you previously logged in? Because the one nice thing about MSAL is it has a token cache. And if you've previously logged in, it will remember that and it will pull out the user if you've already logged in. And then we go and get a client application. And this is the same client application that if you use from the SPFX that you do .API, uh, we're just creating it manually ourselves this way. And I'll show you how I do that in the get client method, which if I scroll down just a little bit over here, there is a, a static uh, factory method and we can say init with middleware. And this is one of the pieces of value that the library brings is it has this middleware pipeline that comes out of the box with handling retries and dealing with uh, making sure that you don't redirect tokens across uh, uh, across domains, although I'm wondering whether in JavaScript that is actually an issue. Um, it certainly is in some of the other languages. And what we've tried to do is across the languages provide this consistent pattern of using these, these middleware pipelines. So in order to get authorization and to be able to get the tokens, we plug in this what we call an implicit MSAL authentication provider with the particular scopes that we will be using in order to make the graph API calls. And we pass this auth provider into the graph client and we return that graph client. And then I basically just set it as a property on the app object. And that property is going to get passed down into various React components that we use throughout the application. 
So one of the first things that we do as soon as you have signed in is go and do get user profile. And if I just go to the definition here, we call a method called get user details, which lives in a service library. And the only reason I, well, there's kind of two reasons that I created the service library. One is because that's kind of how the, the starter app showed it. But the other reason is because I actually converted it into a TypeScript library just to kind of give a feel for how the TypeScript interacts. So if I flip over to get user details, this is in this Grass service library, you can see get user details just takes that client and calls the API and returns the user. And the value here is, oh, no, the, the, the point I was going to make is this is set up currently as a set of functions that you pass the client in. It would probably be a better design to actually just create this as a service where you pass the client into the constructor of that service. So it's actually a class and you don't have to pass the client in on every single action. So anyway, this returns the user, which shows the name and you can get the profile photo and things like that. You can see here how we are getting the events for the calendar. And you can also key hear how we were getting the messages. And we are also building some other higher level capabilities around these libraries. And one of those pieces of functionality we've built is that the problem when you do get messages is you only get like the first page. And if you want to get more, you have to follow that next link. So then you've got to go and get the next link and call it and call it again and again and again. So in the second implementation of the method, I have get all messages where we get the first page, but then we pass it into what we call a page iterator. So you just pass the collection in and we have a callback that adds all of the messages into a collection and then returns all of them. And, and we can do a count and limit it so that we don't end up returning too many. But this page iterator class is just a way of making it easier to deal with these page collections. There are a few other classes that we've started to build in order to deal with these higher level scenarios where you actually, instead of just making one call, you want to make a multiple calls in to achieve a higher level goal. And I don't have that in this source code, but I'm just going to flip over to some preview documentation. This should be up fairly soon. This is the graph request batching. Um, and we, we touched on this very briefly in the Fluent discussion last week, because I know PMPJS has a very similar way of doing this, and it would be great to uh, align what we're doing here, uh, especially because I know there's on the, the, there are plans of adding some extra capabilities into batching on the graph. And again, I don't want us to both have to implement the same mechanism twice. But the idea here is you create a request object. This is going and getting the profile photo request. And then here, in this case, it's a little bit of a strange uh, example. We create, we go get it, and um, then we, we, uh, we request the photo, and then I think we upload the photo right afterwards. And But we create these multiple of requests, convert them into batch request steps, and then package them all up into a single batch request content, which is over here. So here are the different uh, steps that have been put into the batch request content object. And then just using client.api, we pass it to the dollar batch endpoint and pass that entire content. Uh, so this is just a wrapper around making it easier to do batch calls. And the one last example I'll show is the large file upload mechanism. And this is a task that has been built and we've, we've made this available for both OneDrive and SharePoint. And also now you can upload large mail attachments. So you create a task object and you pass it in just the, the standard uh, graph client the file that you're interested in and some options that basically say how big you want those slices to be that you're sending over the wire. And it will take care of taking that file, slicing it up into smaller chunks, and then sending the file uh, one by one. And if you get a failure at some point in the way, you can then resume that upload part way along. So this is another piece of functionality that layers some capabilities on top. So that was really all I wanted to show is just a case of if you want to understand how that graph client works outside of 
the, the SharePoint world and outside of SPFX, this is how you can go around go and play around with it. And uh, we certainly are looking for feedback. We want to know what about it won't work well for the the um, in the SharePoint world. What what stuff we can incorporate and help moving forward with regards to consolidating our efforts between PNPJS and the Graph client. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of perspective of what you're doing, and hopefully everybody's on board of about the fact that we don't want to write all of this code multiple times. And with that, I will hand it back to you, Patrick. Fantastic. Thanks, Daryl, uh, for showing that.